I feel like that needs no other explanation. That just sounds freaking awesome. Not really something to brag about, but. <laughs> she says, you've never read anything like this. He writes some weird stuff. I can already tell this is gonna be a five-star banger. She has free reign. She can write about anything and I'm gonna read it. Yup. Hi. I'm Sam. There's quite literally no one asking me to do this, but there are several 2023 book releases that I'm very excited about and I would like to share them with you today. I had meant to get this out earlier, but I procrastinated and now it's already February, but I think it kind of worked in my favor because it has given me more time to hear about more releases that are coming out this year. I'm hoping that my list will be a little bit different than other people's and there will be some that you maybe have not heard of yet. So for most of these, I'm going to kind of like read the synopsis verbatim just so you get a really good idea of what the book is going to be about because that's kind of all I can talk about right now at this stage because obviously none of us have read these yet. Okay so these are in order of when they are anticipated to be published and the first two I think already technically were published February 7th so sorry I'm a little bit late but the first one is Brutes by Diz Tate. The blurb says it's the Virgin Suicides meets the Florida Project in this wildly original debut. A coming of age story about the crucible of girlhood from a writer of rare and startling talent. We would not be born out of sweetness. We were born out of rage. We felt it in our bones. So basically it takes place in Falls Landing, Florida, and we're following a gang of 13 year old girls who are really obsessed with this one girl in the group, Sammy, who is the local preacher's daughter. It says she is mesmerizing older and in love with Eddie, but suddenly Sammy goes missing. Where is she? Watching from a distance, they edge ever closer to discovering a dark secret about their fame-hungry town and the cruel cost of a ticket out. What they see will continue to haunt them for the rest of their lives. So yeah, that sounds pretty good to me. That sounds very intriguing. The cover is really cool. And I am actually going to be reading this for the Sunny's Book Truck book club in February. So I will let you know how it is. I'm excited. Next is another one that I believe was released February 7th called Big Swiss by Jen Vegan. So I had never actually read any Jen Vegan until like a couple weeks ago. I read Pretend I'm Dead by her. And while it wasn't a total hit for me, I think Jen Vegan's writing is something I'm interested in going back to. I'm definitely gonna give this a shot. So this is about Greta who lives with her friend Sabine in an ancient Dutch farmhouse in Hudson, New York. The house built in 1737 is unrenovated, uninsulated, and full of bees. Greta spends her days transcribing therapy sessions for a sex coach who calls himself Ohm. She becomes infatuated with his newest client, a repressed married woman she affectionately refers to as Big Swiss, since she's tall, stoic, and originally from Switzerland. Greta is fascinated by Big Swiss's refreshing attitude toward trauma. They both have dark histories, but Big Swiss chooses to remain unattached to her suffering while Greta continues to be tortured by her past. One day, Greta recognizes Big Swiss's voice at the dog park. In a panic, she introduces herself with a fake name and they quickly become enmeshed. Although Big Swiss is unaware of Greta's true identity, Greta has never been more herself with anyone. Her attraction to Big Swiss overrides her guilt and she'll do anything to sustain the relationship. So yeah, sounds really weird. I'm ready for more of Jen Vegan's quirky writing and not to brag, but I was the first person who was able to get this from my library. So I already have the audiobook borrowed. Uh, okay, not really something to brag about, but. <laughs> Okay, next is a nonfiction that's coming out in March of this year, and that is How Not to Kill Yourself by Clancy Martin. So this is an intimate, insightful, at times even humorous exploration of why the thought of death is so compulsive for some, while demonstrating that there's always another solution. If you're going to write a book about suicide, you have to be willing to say the true things, the scary things, the humiliating things, because everybody who is being honest with themselves knows at least a little bit about the subject. If you lie or if you fudge, the reader will know. The last time Clancy Martin, the author, tried to kill himself was in his basement with a dog leash. It was one of over 10 attempts throughout the course of his life, but he didn't die. And like many who consider taking their own lives, he hid the attempt from his wife, family, coworkers, and students, slipping back into his daily life with a hoarse voice, a raw neck, and a series of vague explanations. In How Not to Kill Yourself, Martin chronicles his multiple suicide attempts in an intimate depiction of the mindset of someone obsessed with self-destruction. He argues that for the vast majority of suicides, an attempt does not just come out of the blue, nor is it merely a violent reaction to a particular crisis or failure, but is the culmination of a host of long-standing issues. 
He also looks at the thinking of a number of great writers who have attempted suicide and detailed their experiences. He also looks at what the history of philosophy has to say, both for and against suicide, and he looks at the experience of those who have reached out to him across the years to share their own struggles. The result combines memoir with critical inquiry to powerfully give voice to what for many has long been incomprehensible, while showing those presently grappling with suicidal thoughts that they are not alone and that the desire to kill oneself, like other self-destructive desires, is almost always temporary and avoidable. I am very, very interested in reading about this. Mental illness is definitely becoming more and more destigmatized, but I still think that there is a huge stigma around it. And as someone who struggles with mental illness, I think I'm constantly wanting to learn more about it. I just feel like the more I can understand my mental illness and my intrusive thoughts, the more empowered I'll feel. Being able to understand something makes it a lot less scary. So I think it'll be refreshing to read something from someone who has maybe struggled with the same things that I struggle with and who speaks about it in a really candid way. So yeah, I hope that this book is good and I hope that it becomes a resource that I can maybe share with friends, family, loved ones to try and help them understand. I just think it could be a useful tool for helping those who don't struggle with any mental illness to understand what it really is like and what the struggle is like because it can be really hard to explain how it feels to be sick to someone who is not sick in that way. I don't know, I feel like I just rambled for a long time, but I hope that makes sense. Another one that is coming out in March is YN by Esther Yi, and I have since learned that the YN stands for Your Name. And this is about a Korean American woman living in Berlin whose obsession with a K-pop idol sends her to Seoul on a journey of literary self-destruction. It's as if her life only began once Moon appeared in it. The desultory copywriting work, the boyfriend, and the want of anything not Moon quickly fall away when she beholds the idol in concert, where Moon dances as if his movements are creating their own gravitational field, on live streams, as fans from around the world comment in dozens of languages, even on skincare products endorsed by the wildly popular Korean boy band, of which Moon is the youngest, most luminous member. Seized by ineffable desire, our unnamed narrator begins writing YN fanfic in which you, the reader, insert your name and play out an intimate relationship with the unattainable star. Then Moon suddenly retires, vanishing from the public eye. As YN flies from Berlin to Seoul to be with Moon, our narrator too journeys to Korea in search of the object of her love. An escalating series of mistranslations and misidentifications lands her at the headquarters of the Kafka-esque entertainment company that manages the boy band, until at a secret location, together with Moon at last, art and real life approach their final convergence. So this definitely gives me Perfect Blue vibes. Perfect Blue is one of the most disturbing movies I've ever watched, and it disturbs me so much that I actually don't think I can watch it anymore. So I'm excited and very intrigued by this and hoping that it's spooky and crazy and chaotic. I'm looking forward to it. Next is a story collection coming out by Genji Ito called Tombs. So you guys have probably already heard about this one since it's coming out in March. The cover's already been released. I've already pre-ordered this one. Very, very excited for this one. Anytime Junji Ito publishes something, I'm gonna be buying it. So we'll let you know how it is. Next is Biography of X by Catherine Lacey. So I read Pew by Catherine Lacey last year, thought it was really good. I haven't read anything else by her though, so I'm excited to get a little bit more Catherine Lacey in my life. So this is about a woman named X who is an artist, writer, and polarizing shapeshifter. So she dies in her office and her widow, wild with grief and refusing everyone's good advice, hurls herself into writing a biography of the woman she deified. X was recognized as a crucial creative force of her era, she kept a tight grip on her life story. And in her quest to find out, she opens a Pandora's box of secrets, betrayals, and destruction, all the while immersing herself in the history of the Southern Territory, a fascist theocracy that split from the rest of the country after World War II, as it is finally in the present day forced into an uneasy reunification. A masterfully constructed literary adventure complete with original images assembled by X's widow, Biography of X follows a grieving wife seeking to understand the woman who enthralled her. The wife traces X's peripatetic trajectory over decades, from Europe to the ruins of America's divided territories, and when she finally understands the scope of X's defining artistic project, the wife realizes X's deceptions were far crueler than she imagined. That synopsis just used a lot of words that I have never seen or heard in my life, so... Maybe I have too much of a dummy brain for this one, but I'm still looking forward to it and hope that it doesn't make me feel dumb. 
Okay, now we're skipping ahead to June. I don't know why April and May are like, we got nothing exciting going on that I know of. But next is Page Boy by Elliot Page. So this is going to be a memoir of his life, I guess. Like, I mean, that's what a memoir is, Sam. But I'm assuming it's gonna be about their life growing up as an actor and then maybe getting into like them figuring out their identity and his transition. I'm not really sure what part of his life it's gonna focus on, but I'm just very excited because I love Elliot Page's movies. I really like his work so i'm excited to read his memoir next is another one coming out in june called mave fly by cj lead so this is going to be like a horror i think it says by day mave fly works at the happiest place in the world as every child's favorite ice princess gee i wonder who that is by the neon night glow of the sunset strip mave haunts the dive bars with a drink in one hand and a book in the other imitating her misanthropic literary heroes but when gideon green her best friend's brother moves to town he awakes can something dangerous within her, and the world she knows suddenly shifts beneath her feet. Untethered, Maeve ditches her discontented act and tries on a new persona, a bolder, bloodier one, inspired by the pages of American Psycho. Step aside, Patrick Bateman. It's Maeve's turn with the knife. Yup. I feel like that needs no other explanation. That just sounds freaking awesome. Next is another one coming out in June, Everything the Darkness Eats by Eric LaRocca. I love Eric LaRocca. He writes some weird stuff. I'm always so ready to go on the wild ride that I know he's gonna take me on. So the synopsis of this is, an insidious darkness threatens to devastate a rural New England village when occult forces are conjured and when bigotry is left unrestrained. After a recent string of disappearances in a small Connecticut town, a grieving widower with a grim secret is drawn into a a dangerous ritual of dark magic by a powerful and mysterious older gentleman named Hart Crowley. Meanwhile, a member of local law enforcement tasked with uncovering the culprit responsible for the bizarre disappearances soon begins to learn of a current of unbridled hatred simmering beneath the guise of the town's idyllic community. A hatred that will eventually burst and forever change the lives of those who once found peace in the quiet town. Honestly, anytime there's like occult forces, I love occult horror. I am leaving myself in the very capable hands of Eric LaRocca. Okay, moving on to July. We have a new release from Eliza Clark who wrote Boy Parts. I read that last year. Also really much enjoyed that. She's got a new one coming out called Penance and it's blurbed by Julia Armfield who wrote Our Wives Under the Sea. She says, you've never read anything like this. That's like a challenge. I can't say no to that. That like immediately intrigues me. So the synopsis. Do you know what happened already? Did you know her? Did you see it on the internet? Did you listen to a podcast? Did the host make jokes? Did you see pictures of the body? Did you look for them? It's been years since the horrifying murder of 16-year-old Joan Wilson rocked Crow on Sea. Is that a town name? What kind of town name is that? Okay. And the events of that terrible night are now being published for the first time. That story is Penance, a dizzying feat of masterful storytelling where Eliza Clark maneuvers us through accounts from the inhabitants of this small seaside town, placing us in the capable hands of journalist Alec Z. Corelli. Clark allows him to construct what he claims is the definitive account of the murder and what led up to it. Built on hours of interviews with witnesses and family members, painstaking historical research, and most notably correspondence with the killers themselves, the result is a riveting snapshot of lives rocked by tragedy and a town left in turmoil. The only question is, how much of it is true? So, okay, now that I'm reading the synopsis, is this is this actually like part nonfiction? Is this real? Is Joan Wilson really someone who got murdered? Am I dumb? Is Penance by Eliza Clark a true story? Okay, someone else also Googled this, so I don't feel that dumb. Okay, it's fake. Okay, it's fake. It's fiction, guys. God, that took me way too long <laughs> to find that answer. <laughs> Okay, now we are into October. Again, I don't know why there's like a few month jump and like there's nothing going on in August or September. But anyway, next coming out in October is a new release by Ainsley Hogarth. So Ainsley Hogarth wrote Mother Thing, which was one of the best things I read in 2022. I love her writing and I'm so excited that she's already publishing something new. So this is about new mother Danny who has a lot going on. She's worried that her seemingly healthy husband Clark might drop dead, leaving her and her baby destitute. She's worried that she hasn't lived up to her birthright as the daughter of the legendary garbage king DJ Silver, whose waste management company employed the town of Metcalf for decades. And she's really worried that, try as she might, she's not a gym going, manicure sporting, perfectly coiffed normal woman. And then Danny discovers the temple, ostensibly a yoga center, the temple and its guardian, Renata, are committed to helping men reach their full potential. 
And if doing that sometimes requires sex work, so be it. Finally, Danny has found something she could be good at, even great at, something that could save her baby from financial ruin if Clark ever dies. Just as she's preparing to embrace this opportunity though, Renata goes missing, and Danny discovers there might be something else she's good at, detective work. I'm excited. Honestly, Ainsley Hogarth, even just from that single book that I read of hers, has pretty much cemented herself as like an instant read author. I just love her writing, so she has free reign. She can write about anything and I'm gonna read it. Okay, next is another one coming out in October, and that is a new release by Melissa Broder. Melissa Broder's another author where I'm like, yeah, she publishes something, I'm gonna read it. Okay, this one's called Death Valley. In Melissa Broder's astounding new novel, a woman arrives alone at a Best Western seeking respite from an emptiness that that plagues her. She has fled to the California high desert to escape a cloud of sorrow for both her father in the ICU and a husband whose illness is worsening. What the motel provides, however, is not peace but a path, thanks to a receptionist who recommends a nearby hike. Out on the sun scorched trail, god, that's such a hard phrase to say. Sun scorched trail. Sun scorched trail. Scorched is kind of a weird word. It's kind of a hard word to say. Okay, out on the sun scorched trail, the woman encounters a towering cactus whose size and shape mean it should not exist in California. Yet the cactus is there, with a gash through its side that beckons like a familiar door. So she enters it. What awaits her inside this mystical succulent sets her on a journey at once desolate and rich, hilarious and poignant. First thoughts, if this is anything like the cactus juice scene from Avatar The Last Airbender. Drink cactus juice, it'll quench you. Nothing's quenchier. It's the quenchiest. I can already tell this is gonna be a five-star banger. Okay, and then last but not least, Junji Ito has another short story collection coming out in October of this year called Mimi's Tales of Terror. So this is gonna have nine scary stories. Freaking excited for Junji Ito, always, always, always. So yeah, those are 13 books that I'm very much looking forward to reading this year. I am always looking for new books though, so if there are any new releases that you are really excited about, definitely let me know in the comments. And otherwise, you can like this video if you want, comment if you want, subscribe if you want. I would love to have ya. And I really hope that your February reading is going super, super good. So let me know what you're reading. Love you guys so much. And goodbye.